First of all, let me start off by saying this. I've been listening to the Dark Waters channel since 2016, when it all first started. And over that time period, I fell in and out of love with Dark Waters himself. Just like everybody else, he goes through phases where he's active and he's inactive. He goes through phases where he's arguing with people and he's not arguing with people. But the one thing I never questioned about him was whether he was telling the truth or not. These events happened back in 2017. Long before anyone started talking about the Facebook groups and the activity that happened inside of them. I joined one of the Dog Men Facebook groups. And in my mind, it's an investigation group. We're going to get together, go to locations, and investigate. But I didn't realize that it was a hell of a lot more going on in this field than what I was being told. <clears throat> and I wouldn't even phrase it like that. It's not what I was being told. It was what I was assuming. I assumed that most people in this field were out to get evidence. Other people in the field were out to just be entertained. Some people to make money. I had no clue whatsoever the danger that I was putting myself in. The very first trip that these guys organized is the Holly Springs National Forest. Now, if you guys know anything about Holly Springs National Forest, then you know the famous dog man encounter that it all hinged upon. Now, after all this back and forth, it's supposed to... Mm, after all this back and forth on Facebook, it's supposed to be 25 people that go out on this investigation. When I get there, it is only eight people. Pause right here and let me say this. And I want to be clear with you. I've been in and out of all the groups. I've been in the groups with the fuzzy pictures that people argue and fight all the time. I've been in the groups that have real evidence that are private, that you can see some scary things before you make the same mistake that I did. The majority of the people who say they want to find evidence really don't want to find evidence. They will not go out into the field. Now, they'll tell you, yeah, I'll meet you there on Saturday. I really need you to understand before you put yourself in these type of situations and line yourself up for the foolishness that I did that they don't really care. At the last minute, something stops them. They get the heebie-jeebies, but they don't really want to find evidence. Nonetheless, we get there. And it's this small group of people. Listen, maybe I missed the memo, but I was under the impression that we were going out there based on scientific signs, facts, looking for footprints, looking for tree breaks, things that make sense. However, once we get out there, the group is being led by this woman who proclaims she's a psychic. Mm, no. Mm, this is some bullshit is what I'm saying to myself. You proclaim to be a psychic. I have no way of knowing, woman, if you are a psychic or not. But these guys clearly have been following this woman around in the woods on multiple occasions. Now, what made the situation worse was they portrayed it like it was a male-dominated group. But when we got to the field, she was clearly in control. So now I'm protesting this entire situation. Imagine a scene, me standing, leaning on my truck explaining to them hold on man i thought that we were going out here to do this the right way not following behind this woman and everyone gets angry accusing me of being a sexist a misogynist i didn't even know what the word meant all i knew was it was a whole load of bullshit that was going on get this tempers flare she looks at them and starts to calm the situation down and that was the first sign that something weird was going on because it was the way she looked at them. It was almost like they were afraid of her and they began to calm down. And she says, listen, this is not going to take long. We're only going to be out here for a few hours. Why don't you just come along with us and you'll see how we operate and how we do things. Are you familiar with your little inner voice? That little voice that tells you go left instead of going right. Look this way, turn this way. Well, my little inner voice thought saying, no, get your behind in the car and go on about your business. But you see, I wasn't really trained to listen to that voice at that point in time. Oh, buddy, but when I tell you after this encounter, I became trained and I listened. Oh, let me tell you, I listen clearly now because I don't in that moment. And I say, OK, I'll go out with you guys. Let's go. Now, here's the other messed up part about the situation. They didn't want you to carry any firearms into the field. 
<clears throat> because she convinced them that because of her psychic abilities, they would be fine. However, that was something I couldn't go for. Just couldn't cooperate with that one. So as they turn their backs, I open the door, reach the glove compartment and get my side arm and tuck it away and then head off into the woods with them. Now imagine the scene. We're walking through the woods and she kind of has us in this triangular formation, but it's spread out with her in the middle. And she's talking about the woods and how the spirits of the woods and how the trees are telling her which direction to go in and telling her that they move towards the river. Now I'm thinking to myself, is this bitch a witch? The more I listen to her and the more I hear her lingo and the more I hear her talking, this ain't no psychic shit. She ain't saying the spirits is talking to her. She's saying that the trees are talking to her and this is talking to her. And I'm trying to figure this whole situation out. Listen, we have been moving through those woods for about 30, 35 minutes. Hadn't seen sign of nothing. Basically, all we doing is frolicking around, following behind this broad in the woods. When she stops us and says, they're here. Everybody, look around. They're here. And the group of men start to form this circle around her, like they're protecting her. Imagine a scene. She says, they're here. We found the place. Those men circle around her. I'm outside of the circle looking at the situation like, okay, this is some ignorant shit going on in these woods and she looks at me and says you need to join the formation for your own protection i pause right here and let me say this to you and i don't know how i'm gonna say this and not sound like a asshole and i've been accused throughout my lifetime of just being an asshole but i'm thinking to myself bitch ain't nothing you can do to protect me from no damn dog man or no Bigfoot with your little short skinny ass. The most I can do is be a flesh punching bag for one of these monsters if they come in to get you. So I start to back away from the group. Again, she screams, if you want to be protected, fall in rank, get in line if you want to be protected. So now that little voice is talking to me again in my head, that little voice says, didn't I tell you not to come out here in these woods with these people? What is wrong with you? I mean, clear as day, the little voice is saying, didn't I tell you not to come out here? And that right there in that moment is when I knew I was in danger. Not of no cryptids, not of no Bigfoot, not of nothing. I was in danger from this woman and these men. Because the next words that come out of this woman's mouth to these men is you go get him and bring him in line with everyone else. So two of these guys break off their ranks and start walking my way now y'all remember what i told you i reached in that glove compartment and i got that thing i got it tucked away but the issue in my mind but the issue in my mind is do these guys actually have weapons on them or are they just that crazy that they think they're gonna come over here and physically put their hands on me so i let it play out a little bit you know i don't want to draw down on them and have to shoot them once you pull a gun you need to use it so i let it play out they walk up, one of the guys puts his hand on my shoulder and says, come on, man, you're making this more difficult than it needs to be. Come on. So I tell him politely, listen, man, I'm going to need you to take your hands up off of me and I'm about to leave. The other guy who's bigger and more muscular goes to wrap his arm underneath my armpit like he's going to drag me like I'm a kid and bring me in line. And I tell him, I say, man, you got four seconds to get your fucking hands up off of me. He looks and starts to yank and pull me and I reach in, grab my weapon, and pistol whip him across the head. Pow, pow, pow. Now I done backed off. His head is bleeding. The other guy's in shock. She's screaming, oh my, what is going on? And all of a sudden, now everybody become victims in this situation. What are you doing? You're attacking us. And everybody turns into a victim. The most insane shit I've ever seen. So now I have the weapon drawn, and I explain to them, listen, I'm going back to my vehicle. You guys can frolic around here in the woods and do whatever the hell it is that you guys do. But I'm going back to my vehicle. And if anybody follows me, I'm killing them right here where we stand. And so I slowly start to back out of there. And when I tell you that man is bleeding out, oh, his head is bleeding all over the place. And the way I see it, if there was a dog man or a Bigfoot around, oh, yeah, they coming to eat on you, boy, because you was bleeding bad. <clears throat> and I get this. They all turn their attention to him and start tending to his wounds. And I get up out of the woods, get back to the vehicle, pull off, 
but I don't leave. I want to see how long these people are going to be here in these woods. I'm sitting there off the roadway. And here's the freaking part of it. I pull my vehicle off of the roadway into the trees where nobody can see me, but I have a clear sighting of their vehicle. And do you know, they didn't come out of the woods till nine o'clock at night, even with him bleeding profusely from his head. They didn't come out of the woods until 9 p.m. Now, you may be speculating to yourself like I was. You know, what the hell is this situation about? Why do we even go out here if we're not going to find Dog Man, if we're just going to follow him behind this woman? I couldn't. And that's where I was for about two years. I couldn't quite understand what was going on. Until I heard Dog Waters talking about the sexual perversion that takes place in this field. I started to do some research and it requires certain sexual acts and certain murderous acts in order for a human being to change into a werewolf. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Cherie Skipson. And I'm Katie Moore. Police are trying to figure out what led to a mass shooting in New Orleans East today. It happened in the Village de l'Est neighborhood, and two men died, four more were hurt. Devin Bartolotta has been following this story for us and joining us now in studio. Devin, what do we know so far? Yeah, guys, we just found out a little bit ago that the, one of the men who died was 25 years old, but daylight was not a deterrent for this mass shooting. It happened in a busy neighborhood with houses, apartments, and kids playing nearby. The councilman, Oliver Thomas, Thomas says it is a hot spot for gang-related crime. The evidence markers on Alcy Forche Boulevard tallied at least 99, marking dozens of shell casings from a shooting that ended with two men dead and four more in the hospital. A witness tells us off camera he saw multiple men shooting from this breezeway that connects this strip mall parking lot with apartments in the back. He says the dozens of shots sounded like a machine gun. Three crime scenes were cordoned off as police investigated. It seems to be three freaks. So. Now listen to me when I say this to you. I'm not going to say that dog man saved my life because I don't believe that's what all of this was about. I think I was just at the right place at the right time and it happened to be at the same place at the same time. Now I'm not sure how much you know about New Orleans, but New Orleans East is called Afghanistan for a reason. It's more shooting, stabbings, killings and murders go on in New Orleans East than most foreign countries. And I'm talking about foreign countries with no governments. More people get shot, stabbed, and killed out there than in a foreign country without a government. Now, if you're in New Orleans East and you ride down Chef Mentor Highway and you keep on going past Bullet Road and you keep on going past Michoud and you keep on going out there where I live, there's one or two gas stations out there. Now, I'm not sure if your wife is like my wife, but my wife does not do anything with her vehicle at all. She doesn't check tire pressure. She doesn't deal with the oil. And the worst thing about the whole situation is she does not inform me about problems that are going on with the vehicle. And in a moment, you'll understand how I found myself in this messed up situation. I am headed home from a long day's work. It is 3.30 in the morning. This particular day, I used her car because she was going to Mississippi to meet with her mother and her sister. And my car was newer, so I let her take my vehicle out on the road. Now, understand, we've had issues with her car in the past, and under no circumstances do I want you believing that I'm an irresponsible husband. Because I'm not. The thing is, my wife's job is five miles away from home, so she can drive five miles from the house and back 
and not have any problems. My job is way over in Avondale, and that's a very long drive. Now that we've clarified all of that, so nobody won't be sitting here talking about me saying, well, you should have given your wife the new car. She didn't need the new car. Nonetheless, 3.30 in the morning, and boosh, two flat tires. Not one, count them, two flat tires. Right there on the side of the road on Chef Mentor Highway. Now, if you really want to understand the environment that I found myself in, early in the morning, look up Chef Mentor Highway, look past Mishu, and you will see as you go past Mishu, headed to where I live, there's nothing but swamps out there. So now, I'm on the side of the road, 3.30 in the morning, with two flat tires and only one spare. In a situation like that, there's absolutely nothing you can do for yourself. It doesn't make sense to change one tire and still have a flat tire. So now I'm on my cell phone trying to get in contact with AAA to get somebody to come out. Now stop, pause right here in the story. Let me make you understand something. If you recall, I told you that New Orleans East is like living in Afghanistan. Or, and unfortunately, the thugs out there would rather rob you on the side of the road when you have a flat tire than help you. So now I'm out there at 3.30 in the morning, losing my mind, because I realize there's a significant chance that somebody driving by is going to stop, and they ain't stopping to help me. They stopping to rob me. So normally, when you have a flat tire on the side of the road, you turn on your emergency lights, and you stand next to the vehicle, and you're waiting for someone to come. No, 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 not me. I don't have emergency lights on. My vehicle is well off of the road. I have all the lights off, and I'm standing off over in the darkness. Because frankly, I don't want anybody to see me until AAA pulls up. Now, the worst thing about the situation is the AAA dispatcher told me that it was going to be about 45 minutes before anyone can get there. So now I'm standing there alone in the darkness on the side of the road and the mosquitoes are going crazy, feasting on my flesh like I'm a human buffet. When a car drives by, a blacked out Hellcat Charger, they drive by and start to slow down. And I need you to understand, we're talking about Chef Mentor Highway, past Mishu, between Venetian Isles is where I'm at. Now, if you ever been out there, man, we talking about in the middle of damn nowhere. I, in fact, they got wild hogs out here that people come and hunt. Matter of fact, if it starts to flood and the hurricane comes in, this exact same damn road goes underwater, you got alligators, moccasins, everything else out here in these streets. And this vehicle slows down. And I'm standing there leaning on this fence saying to myself, well, I'll be damned. I'll be damned. This is about to end bad. Just when I thought they were about to turn around, they take off and keep on going. So now I'm standing there relieved, thinking to myself, okay, all right, maybe they just think it's an abandoned car. I'm just going to chill, lean back, relax. And hopefully, hopefully, the tow truck will be here soon. Five minutes pass, 10 minutes pass, 15 minutes pass. A couple of cars pass by, nobody slows down, everything is all good. Outside of the mosquitoes, I'm fine. Then I hear that Hellcat coming back. And I don't know if you know how them cars sound, but them things is loud. It's flying back in my direction gets right up to where I am and they slam on the brakes, hop out the car and they're going to bust out my car windows. Now it's two of them. I can clearly see the driver, the passenger hops out and he's about to smash my window. I'm like, yo, yo, listen, man, don't break my window. I'm waiting on a ride. However, I'm back off the road into the darkness and they can't see me and it startles them. They get shook. Homeboy turns around, runs, hop back in the car and they take off. Boom, they're gone. Now I'm thinking to myself, okay, cool, this going to be all right. Now, as I watch an air car going back towards the city, I guess a thought jumped in their mind that, well, whoever that is, we're going to rob them because they hit the brakes, spin around, and start flying back towards me with the high beam lights on. They pull up, park on the angle with the lights shining on me, and the next thing I hear is, give me your wallet, give me your wallet, throw us your wallet, throw us your wallet. And I'm like, listen, bro, I don't have nothing on me. Give me your mother wallet. Give me your wallet. And I say again, 
Now I'm reaching into my back pocket to get my wallet and I'm like, bruh, you about to be disappointed. I don't have no money on me. And all my bank accounts is negative, homie. So here you can have the wallet. The wallet hits the ground in front of the vehicle. He walks around, picks it up and starts rummaging through it. That's when I get a glimpse at what this boy holding. A mini AK-47. Turn me into Swiss cheese right here on the side of the road. So now I'm backing away trying to get to the edge of this fence and get around on the other side. And I'm going to take off running because I'm not about to die out here on the side of the road. Then he realizes I'm not lying to him. He says, give me the keys. Give me the car keys. I'm like, bro, I'm on the side of the road because the car got two flat tires. You can't go nowhere in the car. Give me the keys. Let me tell you something. I don't know if you ever had somebody point an AK-47 pistol at you, but when they point that pistol at you, it gets your mind right. So now I'm digging in my pocket, throwing them the keys. I'm saying, Lord, please don't let these Negroes murder me out here on the side of the road. I'm going to be an unsolved murder. They will never, ever find them. Bro, listen to me. As I'm saying that out of my mouth, bro, the trees on the other side of the road start shaking. I welcome you to look at the Google Maps. It's right there. The trees on the other side of the road start shaking. And I'm talking about something massive is running through them trees. So much so that the dude who picks up the keys looks over in that direction. Now, mind you, it's dark. The only reason why I know something's coming through the trees is because of the noise that it's making. Next thing you hear is a growl. And bro, it sounded like 15 Rottweilers growling all at the same damn time when i tell you they were shook up bruh homeboy hops in the car they speed off and get this this is the craziest part now listen you know how fast a hellcat can accelerate bruh let me tell you something this thing was on their ass and then next thing you know they're gone and it's gone so now i'm really shook up Listen to me, it wasn't no hogs because hogs don't growl and hogs don't make entire trees shake. The problem I have is that I'm still out there on the side of the road by myself. So now I decide the best thing for me to do is just go ahead on and sit in the car. I sit in that car for like another 30, 35 minutes. And finally, the AAA tow truck pulls up. He hooks my car by hopping to the front of the tow truck with him. And I'm just sitting there staring off in the space thinking about what happened. He says, man, you all right? Something happened out here. What's wrong? I tell him exactly what happened. And he just looks at me. He says, man, you know why it took so long for me to come out here to get you, right? And I'm like, no. He said, because nobody else wanted to come out here. Between the drug dealers, the murderers, and the Rougarou, don't nobody want to come back here. Okay, so it's hard for me to kind of figure out where to start telling you my story. So let me just say this. My family is from Punta del Agua, Argentina. And for as long as I can remember, my family has been in the business of harvesting sunflowers. I remember being a kid playing out in the fields full of sunflowers, being chased by bees and stung left and right. And it was in these very same fields where my brother and I had our dog man encounter. But... However, before I get to that, let me just explain to you a little bit about the process of growing sunflowers. It's important that I share this with you so you will understand some of the things that were going on. Now, the beginning of the process is that the sunflower seeds are planted shallow in the earth. And then months later, they blossom and grow. And you have fields. I'm talking about, and our family had thousands of hectares of sunflower fields. During that time period when the flowers are blossoming is the time when the bees come out now pause and let me say this if you're allergic to bees do not under any circumstances go to a sunflower field because you will get stung nonetheless the flowers grow and then they get to the point to where they start to die and dry out and then each sunflower seed sometimes hundreds per plant 
is ready to be harvested. And those seeds are harvested and turned into sunflower oil. Now, if you don't know, sunflower oil is the second most used cooking oil in the world. Now, the majority of sunflower oil comes from Russia and the Ukraine. However, down here in Argentina, we do quite a bit of production ourselves. Now, let's hit rewind and go back and I'll share some things with you. The very first time my brother and I had any clue that these creatures that you call dog man existed was during the planting season. The two of us were out there working the seeding machine. If you don't know what a seeding machine is, imagine a giant tractor on the front. You feed the seed into these grates and then you drive along and it plows the soil and sees the soil all at one time. My brother is up front loading the seeds. I'm behind the wheel when I see something about 150 yards away running full speed across the field. Now, to me, it looked like a giant black dog. And when I say giant, I mean the size of a bull running across the field. But understand, this is flat land, very few trees anywhere. So we're able to stand there and watch this gigantic dog run across open fields all the way out into the distance. The two of us look at each other, shake our heads and get back to work. That was the very first time. Now, that was the very first time we saw one of these creatures. The second time we had an encounter with this thing, we were both in a truck with my father. God rest his soul, he's passed on now. It's nighttime. We're traveling home from my uncle's house who lived about 20 miles away. We're driving up the road and you see a giant black wolf standing on the side of the roadway. This time, we got a clear glimpse at it. Nine feet tall, black, muscular wolf standing on two legs. Now, the weirdest thing about this encounter was... I think the headlights startled it because it just stood there and stared at us as we rolled by. Imagine a scene that's on the passenger side of the road. My brother's in the front seat. I'm in the back seat. Both of us are on the passenger side. The two of us are freaking out as we see this thing. And my dad is just driving along like he doesn't see anything. Once we pass it up, we're a couple of miles away from home. I'm asking my dad. I'm saying, listen, did you not see this thing? His only reply is, yes, son, I saw it but there's nothing I can do about it. Those things have been around here for a very long time. Don't bother it, and it won't bother you. We go home, go inside, didn't have a problem with it at all. Fast forward, my brother gets his girlfriend pregnant. They decide they're gonna get married. Now it's me, my mother, my father, my brother, and his pregnant wife all living in a house together. It's 3.30 a.m. when I hear his wife screaming at the top of her lungs. I come down the steps into the living room, looking around, the front door is open and I hear her outside screaming. When I go outside, she's down on the ground with her back against the front side of the house, holding her belly. Understand, it's pitch black out there. The only light is the light from the front porch. And she is in, and she is in tears. My brother and father come outside and we're trying to figure out what's going on with her because she's absolutely hysterical we get her up on her feet get her back into the house sit her on the sofa she starts to explain to us that she was feeling nauseous so she went outside for some fresh air sat down in a rocking chair on the porch and was rocking back and forth singing to the baby when she heard something rustling to her left on the side of the house at first she ignores the sound but then she hears it again and turns and looks in that direction and sees these giant yellow eyes staring at her now the way she described the size of these eyes she took her fist and she balled them up and she held both of her fists up into the air and said this is what the size of these eyeballs were like so now my brother is spazzing out losing his mind he grabs a shotgun goes outside into the darkness looking for whatever it was we spend hours that night circling the house and circling the property looking for something didn't find anything the next morning we come back and the only thing we find are these two gigantic canine footprints so now the entire family is up in arms my mother's afraid my brother's wife is afraid my dad is on edge my brother has lost his damn mind and to make the situation worse it's harvesting time we spent hours i'm talking about 12 hours a day working out in the fields which would mean that we would leave my mother and his wife at home alone now, for the first three days of harvesting, 
Everything went smooth. Didn't have a problem whatsoever. But it was on the fourth day of harvesting that all hell broke loose. Understand, we're up at 4 a.m. Having breakfast. Work started as soon as the sun came up. Well, the sun comes up and we start to head towards one of our back fields. We're riding along the roadway. And this thing waits till we get all the way to the back field. That's where my father spots this thing. Rise up and make a beeline straight for the house. Pause right here and let me say this to you. Naturally, you may be saying to yourself, how do you know that this was dog man that was running towards the house? In your mind, and in your mind, you may be saying it's daybreak. There's not a whole bunch of light. And you're right. But when you're used to working, as soon as the sun comes up, your eyes become adjusted to seeing everything. So we knew, combine the fact that this thing was standing up, running on two legs, and it was sprinting towards the house like an Olympic track runner. Trust and believe we knew what we were seeing. So now we're all in a panic, hop in the pickup truck, and instead of taking a road back out, we cut straight across the fields, making a beeline for the house. Now, I don't know if, now I'm not sure if you've ever been on farmland, but there's a reason why you cut roads through farmland. Because when you ride across that soil, it's a bumpy ride. We're flying 85 miles an hour across those fields. Trying to intersect this thing as it's headed towards the house and it is out running us. And this right here, in this moment that things really became terrifying. Because as we're coming on an angle to the house, it's going around the side of the house to the front. When I tell you, we damn near ran into the side of our house, trying to come to a stop, jump out. My brother and my father circle around the front side of the house, headed towards the front door. I go around the back side of the house, going into the back door. And we all meet. Now, listen to me. This is when it gets crazy. We all meet in the living room and there's no sign of this thing whatsoever. So now we're standing there. My mother's freaking out. My sister-in-law is hyperventilating. And that's when we hear movement on top of our roof, heavy movement. The wood was creaking and cracking. And again, understand, this is daybreak. The sun is coming up. So now the three of us go out of the front door armed, looking at the roof. And this thing is squatted down on our roof. The wood on the roof is warping and bending, and it's just staring at us. Listen, I'm going to stop right here and let me explain this to you. To this day, I have no clue what it wanted or why it came there. But when I tell you we lit that thing up, we shot it multiple times. Now, the first two bullets that hit it, it didn't even bother to react to them. It was my brother shot at his head and hit its ear, blowing a portion of its ear off that it turned ran up our roof, jumped up into the air. It looked like something from a freaking horror movie. And so now we're scrambling around the back side of the house to get more shots in on it. And by the time we get to the side of the house, this thing is 80 yards away. And my brother and my father were not letting this go. So now we're back in our pickup truck trying to chase this thing down. And when I tell you they are fast, They are fast and it is cutting across field after field after field after field. And we are driving across people's fields, chasing this thing down. And we finally catch up with this thing at the Rio Delgado River. Now, I don't know if it had reached the maximum distance that it could run. I don't know if it had overheated. I can't explain to you why this thing stopped. But as we got closer to that spot on the river, it was laying down on the ground panting and my father rammed into it with the truck. My father ran into it with the truck going about 60 miles an hour. I'm not sure if you ever been driving down the road and ran into a deer or maybe hit a bear or hit an elk. But when you slam into something that big going that fast, It truly is an accident tore the completely tore the front of that truck up. We hop out and start shooting. It gets up and starts to move towards the river as we shoot and hit it. The next thing I know, it's jumping into the river. 
It goes underwater and it never comes up. We stayed there for two hours, working our way up and down that river, looking for this thing and not a sign of it. And let me say this to you. I've had the pleasure of listening to a lot of Dogman Encounters and I've heard people say that these things are invincible and maybe there is a version of them that's invincible, but this one wasn't invincible. It wasn't invincible at all. In fact, I think we killed it. I don't have the body, but I can tell you one thing. It ain't never been back to our property again. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only James Williams, Dark Waters, and I'm back. And I'm going to give you a little bit of inside baseball on this story before, and I'll tell you why I want to give you inside baseball. This is an outlier story for me, and I vetted it. It's true. Um, I talked to this gentleman's wife. Uh, I talked to the two brothers. And the reason why this is an outlier story for me is because it doesn't truly fit um, each and every characteristic of where these encounters happen. So this area in Argentina is primarily farmland, but it's not corn that's grown there. And I think it may be interesting. I'm, I'm looking for more encounters in that area to add to the data set, because in my mind, it may not just be that it needs to be corn fields. It may just need to be any crop being grown. So now there's definitely a waterway, a river within, I want to say 50 miles of the area. Um, and that's where they ended up confronting it and shooting it. And they believe they killed it because it went under the water and it never resurfaced. However, I'm not so sure about that. But I got to take them at their word because I wasn't there. Now, what I want to try and figure out is where it could have come from. Um, and please look it up on the, on a map. It's uh, Punta, P-U-N-T-A del... Um, Agua, A-G-U-A, and um, Argentina. When you look it up on Google Maps, at first it's going to bring you to a restaurant. Um, it's a certain province in Argentina. Matter of fact, I'm just going to put the... I'll put the coordinates to the area there. I'm not going to put the coordinates to the house. Um, but they're not hard to find because there's only so many houses there. It's a bunch of farmland. But... As a researcher, this one intrigues me because it's outside of the normal, the data sets of what I've been hearing, seeing, and collecting. The behavior pattern is pretty much normal. They like to intimidate people. I don't know what it was about um, his wife been being pregnant. I think it was directly correlated to the pregnancy. And I haven't had many encounters where women who've been pregnant had dog man encounters. So... This is another outlier for this story. And it's one of those things that I find to be kind of confusing to me. Um, and I would like to get you guys' opinion on it. Why do you think that um, it would be attracted to a pregnant woman? I, I don't know. I mean, I know there's reasons why they're attracted to a woman who's in who's menstruating. Um, that's a common, common, common occurrence with Dogman and Bigfoot. But with her being pregnant, I, I, I just don't have enough data and enough information on it and so also if any of you had an encounter with any kind of cryptid while you were pregnant i would love to hear the story so i can um collect more data on those type of encounters if any of you women had encounters with dog men while you were pregnant i think you got to be a little specific nowadays nonetheless um I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it was uh, entertaining. But it's it's a point of confusion for me. And I'm at the point now where um, these type of things are a little bit more interesting to me than your typical sighting. Because it's more of a puzzle for me to try and figure out what's going on. You know, why is this happening in this location um, to this family? So... The two things I want to know is what do you think? Look at the area. And the second thing is, you know, have any of you ladies out there had encounters with cryptids while you were pregnant? Um, for me to have a valid data set, I feel like I need 10 to 15 encounters on it. Um, and I don't have to make 10 to 15 public, but I need at least 10 to 15 
So if you had an encounter with something like this while you were pregnant, please reach out to me. And hopefully everything worked out for you. It didn't go crazy or wasn't nothing insane or absolutely terrifying. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, it's the one and only James Williams Dark Waters. And I'm is out. Peace. Ever since I had my encounter with this creature, it's like I've been invited into another world. Now listen, I was born and raised in Houston. Far North is what we call my hood. Violent, crime filled, high drama, standard hood shit. And I want to be clear with you, I had no idea that these things existed. And because I had no idea that they existed, I broke every unwritten rule about engaging them. Now you may be sitting here listening to the story asking yourself, okay, so how did you end up in a situation where you were around these creatures? And the truth of the matter is this. It was all about the money. It really was. It wasn't until way later that I found out that people had a fascination with werewolves. Understand, the hood where I grew up at, you know, you watch horror movies, but shit's scary enough. Going out your front door, you could get shot. Going to the grocery store, you can get robbed. Going to your car, you could get carjacked. So I had absolutely no leaning towards hard or paranormal, none of that foolishness. I was just trying to live my life and I needed a little bit of extra bread. And then comes along my homie Bug. Now listen to this, I get a phone call, ring, ring, it's Bug. And let me tell you a little bit about Bug. Bug is a hustler extraordinaire. He's one of those guys, he was selling dope when we were sophomores in high school. Been dating the same girl Kizzy since we were sophomores in high school. And Bug and Kizzy have a complicated relationship, mainly because Kizzy is extremely violent. Now, if you're from the hood, you done encountered violent women in the hood before. Type of chick that'll black your eye, then call the police. That's the type of chick Kizzy is. And she's been that way since we was 14, 15 years old. Fast forward, Bug calls me, he says, listen, man, I gotta take Kizzy out of town. She wanna go to Jamaica, and I need you to hold down one of my spots for me. Now, I'm thinking he talking about a drug spot, trap house. But no, I didn't know Bug had graduated, stepped up to the big boy game. He was on some whole other stuff. So he swings by my crib, pulls up in a blacked out Jeep Tahoe, and this dude gets out the driver's side of the car. And I'm not talking about a regular looking dude. I'm talking about one of the military looking white boys with them box heads. He gets out and stands next to the vehicle, then Bug gets out. Now pause right here and let me say this. First of all, the blacked out Tahoe riding through the hood. Then the first person jumping out of the Tahoe is old marine looking white boy. I'm talking about a chisel, chin, steel eating looking white boy. It's some shit about to go down. So now Bug is getting out of the car. As he's getting out, all my people are starting to come in this direction because everybody trying to figure out what the hell is going down. However, once people start to realize it's just Bug, everything calms down. We go inside. He says, look, man, I'm going to break it down for you. I got this new hustle that I'm on. He says, I'm not moving the weight. I'm not doing none of that, man. I'm a facilitator. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. And I understand what the word facilitate means, but I don't know what being a facilitator means. What are you facilitating, Bug? That's when he goes on this tirade, talking about Halliburton, Pfizer, Lockheed Martin. He said, you know what all those companies got in common? And I'm like, no. He says, they all make money off the dope game. We the only fools out here on the corner on a block getting shot up over dope but they all make money off the dope game and ain't none of them white folks getting shot so this is what i'm doing now i'm a facilitator he goes on explaining to me that he set up certain properties around the country where he flow of contraband and illegal items to me it sounded like he was still pushing dope but he goes a little bit deeper he says man i don't have nothing all i have is cabins in the woods cabins on farms where people come by and i facilitate a rest stop for them. While they're driving along from point A to point B, they can stop, spend the night with me, and I guarantee their load and their safety. So now I'm sitting there listening to it, and I ain't gonna lie to you, you sound like a cool hustle. But I gotta run some questions. Bomb, I'm like, look, Bug, I understand what you're saying, 
You facilitate things for people. You make sure everything is safe. Kind of like a concierge, right? He says, yeah. But my question for you, Bug, is this. How do you stop somebody just from rolling up, whacking everybody, and taking whatever they got? That's when he smiles and he says, well, I'll explain that to you when you come by. I'm like, well, man, I'm not really sure if I want to be involved in this. That's when Bug says, I'll pay you $25,000, bro. All you got to do is just stay on the property for a week while me and Kizzy go to vacation. That's it. While I'm in Jamaica, you be there, answer the phone. Everything else should run smooth. My people are going to be there. So now imagine a scene. I'm sitting there on my sofa looking around. And I don't know if you know this. Being a dope boy is nothing like what you see on TV. It's not glitz and glam. It's not no damn rap video. It's a trap house. This was the trap house I was in. And it was sloppy and messy. Now my crib, it was okay. Now at the end of the day, the average dope boy like me, I make about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. I'm telling you. And I don't have a problem admitting it to you. I'm average at this. Now you add in the cost of business, right? Getting picked up, bonding yourself out, bailing and bonding your other people's out. Man, it comes down to like $30,000 a year. But this dude's trying to give me 25 racks for a week. So I say, listen, let me think about it a little bit, Bugs. I'll give you a call in about an hour. He hops up, gets in his car, rolls out, and I sit there, roll a blunt, smoke, and thinking, man, maybe I should just handle this, do this, get this 25 racks, and maybe he'll plug me in so I can do this more often. And see, in my mind, that's what I was more worried about. I wasn't really worried about getting that paper. I was worried about things in the long run, playing the long game. Let me get in with Bug, see what's happening, get me some money. Now, in between me getting high, I decide to play a video game, then I get hungry, bada bing, bada boom. It takes me about four hours before I can call Bug back and tell him yes. But I call him, I say, listen, man, I'll do it. He tells me, look, I want you to come out to this area and pause. I'm not going to disclose the exact area, but I will tell you this. It's within 200 miles of Richard, Texas. He tells me to meet him at the spot Friday morning. He's going to run everything down to me, pay me, bada bing, bada boom. Friday the roads around, I hop in the whip, head out there, pull up, skirt. And let me tell you something. When you pull up to this place, it's just a huge plot of land with a fence. Like looking at the land, looking head on, you don't really see anything but this little small shack. And by shack, I mean 10 by maybe 15 feet. Going to the gate, pull up to the shack. Bug is inside of the shack. And the grizzled chin white boy is there with him as well. Now, inside, this thing is modern. I'm talking about a high-tech security system. I'm talking about monitors on the wall, servers, the whole nine. Now, for the next couple of days, you're going to be right up in here. You're going to be checking cameras, making sure everything going smooth. My man Joseph over here is going to be with you. Looking over to his left, the big grizzled chin white boy that looked like he eats steel. Turns out his name is Joseph. Now, pause right here. Let me describe Joseph for you. 6'3", 215, all muscle. Look like he can run up a mountain and beat up a gorilla. That's what he looks like. Bug goes on to explain to me that they got three guests coming in. It shouldn't be a problem. Once we check them in, everything is cool. Then he goes on to tell me if something goes wrong, that Joseph and the rest of his guys will handle it. So now I'm sitting there looking around, kind of overwhelmed by the whole situation. Because you got to realize, I knew Bug was smart when we was in high school. He was like genius level smart. The kind of kid that could do homework without reading a book smart. But to sit back and see what he had built out looking at those cameras, there were different cabins off in the woods on this property. It all started to dawn on me what this Negro was doing. He had straight up created an Airbnb for dope dealers, an Airbnb for drug smugglers and gun runners. That's what he had created. So now I'm sitting there head in hand thinking about it all. And the only thing that came to mind to ask him was like, listen, Bugs, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, tell me what could go wrong. Him and Joseph look at each other. And then he turns to me. and He says, well, we really ain't had no problems because people don't know where this place is and they don't know how to find us. I guess the worst thing that can go wrong is them damn werewolves could come back again. Pause. Stop. Rewind. I'm looking at him thinking to myself, did this nigga just say werewolves? And he did. He said. Them werewolves could come back. So now nah, I'm saying, Buzz, quit fucking with me, man. Ain't no such thing as werewolves. He says, nah, I'm serious. Last month, we was on the backside of the property fixing some sensors, and there were some werewolves back there. Now, have you ever had a person tell you something so casually that it's kind of like pfft, nothing to it? But in your mind, it really is something to it? That's how Bug is talking. I'm looking at Joseph trying to get a read on his face, and it's just stone cold. Bug says, yeah, that's about the worst case scenario, but I don't think we're going to have no problems with that. 
Now get this. 15 minutes pass. He's explaining to me how to use the whole system. He walks over to a safe, opens it up, gives me 25 racks, cash, puts it in my hand. Boom. Here you go. And then he leaves me there with Joseph. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around a Marine, special operator, secret service, anything like that. But these guys are extremely polite, but yet firm at the same time. Joseph is referring to me as sir, but I'm younger than him, but he keeps calling me sir. And so I'm like, Joseph, so what's the first thing we do? He looks at me and says, well, what do you want to do, sir? I tell him, well, I, I don't know what to do, Joe. What, what do you think I should do? He says, well, sir, we're supposed to sit here and watch the camera, sir. Now, listen, after about 30 minutes of going back and forth with this man and him calling me, sir, I start to get a tad bit agitated, but I know ain't no way in hell I'm about to whoop his ass. So I'm not about to threaten him. So I said, listen, Joe, if we're going to work together, you, you, you can't just be calling me, sir, man. You can't be calling me, sir, man. Just, just, just respond. You don't have to do that. And his response is, yes, sir. That was Friday. Fast forward, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's all good. When I tell you there's nothing going on, you had the people check in, everything is smooth. We ain't having no problems. This is the easiest 25 racks I done ever made in my life. And as Thursday closes in, me knowing that I only got one more day, I'm sitting here saying to myself, man, I can't believe I done made this kind of money. And this is the thing about money. Now, let me tell you something about money. If you never really had cash money in your hand, you see, you start spending money in your head before it's really yours. Yes, I had that money in my bag. I hadn't spent the dime of it, but I had already started spending that money in my mind. Like, I'm going to get this. I'm going to do this. Boom, boom, boom. I'm real excited. 48 hours, I'm out the door, right? Wrong. Fucking wrong, man. I'm talking about Dave Chappelle. Wrong. Because Wednesday night, it's me and Joe. We up in there chilling, talking. I done broke the ice. We kind of laughing a little bit about things. When all the cameras on the back side of the property go out at the same time, Joe looks at me. I look at him. Joe looks at me. I look at him. He gets on the radio and tells the rest of the guys to come towards the front. Pause right here. Let me say this. I had never met the other guys that were there. It was just me and Joe this entire time. So five minutes later, up comes two more grizzled chin white boys who look like they chew on steel. And this is when shit starts to go crazy. Joe walks over to a locker, grabs a handgun, hands it to me and says, look, come to the back of the property with us. Pause. Stop. I'm from the hood. I done shot people. Done been shot at. I wouldn't consider myself a shooter, but I will shoot. There's a huge difference. However, the expectations laid out to me as to what I needed to do by bug did not dictate me taking a gun and going out into the darkness, walking around on the back side of this property. There was nothing in the job description that he explained to me. That signified that I needed to do this. So I tell Joe, I say, listen, Joe, I think I'm going to stay right here while you guys go check it out. They all look at each other. And then Joe looks at me and he says, well, OK, here's the scenario. Let's say all three of us go towards the back of the property and it's a setup. And while we're back there, somebody comes through the front gate. What's the first place you think they're going to stop right here? Who do you think they're going to kill first? You. So the way I see it is this. If you come back there with us, you're safe. If you stay right here. I can't protect you. Now, unless you're telling me that you can handle yourself well enough to defend yourself against highly trained individuals, because that's the only type of people that are going to come here, then you should come with us. But if you can handle yourself, stay here. <laughs> I sit there for a second. I'm like, nah, bro, I can't handle myself like that. We about to go. Now, the four of us start the process of walking to the backside of the property. And I want to remind you the type of men that I'm with. Military type dudes. They're walking along like it's no problem. Man, we are going uphill and they just are walking like it's nothing. Not breathing hard, not doing nothing. We get to this point where there's a plateau and wham, we get to the fence line where the cameras are. And I need to paint a picture for you. Darkness in the building, darkness out there. So Joe starts to check the cameras, gets to the first spot. He shines his light. He says, listen, it's kind of weird. The lines haven't been cut. They've been ripped. The three of them look at each other. We move further along, which is further away. Get to the next spot where the next camera is. That camera's on the ground and crushed like a Coca-Cola can. When Joe sees that, he says, listen, guys, we're going to head back towards the front. This is not what we thought it was. I'm going to repeat that. This is not what we thought it was. But see, in my mind, I had no thoughts as to what it was. So as we're walking along, I said, Joe, well, what do you mean by this is not what we thought it was? The three of them kind of look at each other and don't say anything. I'm like, Joe, listen to me, babe. I'm going to need you to talk to me. What's going on out here? He said, well, I thought it was somebody coming to try and infiltrate the property. 
but it doesn't look like it. it doesn't make sense why would they go through all the trouble to crush a camera as opposed to just cutting the wires this is something else going on out here now mind you i remember the fact that bug said that there were werewolves out here but it didn't dawn on me that this could have been a werewolf so i'm walking and they're walking everything is cool and then it goes quiet and i'm gonna try my best to describe this type of quietness to you it's like you're walking along you hear the crickets you hear everything and then everything stops it's not like you walk into a bubble it's like you're walking and then nature stops that's what it seemed like nature decided to turn off like somebody clicked off the switch to all the sounds of nature and it's just dead quiet i notice it those guys notice it and they start to speed up the pace of their walking a few seconds after that i would say about 15 seconds after that you hear this growl and it's not like a like this deep guttural growl it actually sounded like a little dog growling truthfully it sounded like a puppy growling for me it was one of those things i noticed i heard it but it didn't register in my mind as a threat but to them it registered as a threat because they start to put space in between each other now they're grabbing their weapons and turning the lights on on the front of their weapons and i'm saying to myself man y'all tripping it's just a little dog out here man let's go let's get back to the front well we move about 30 more yards and then there's another growl this growl that wasn't no damn puppy this sounded like a monster i'm talking about a deep nasty monstrous growl like something off a freaking sci-fi movie and i want to say this to you i've been shot at i've had people walk by and shoot at me people drive by and shoot at me i've been shot in my legs my arms and my back all at the same time and the amount of fear that hit my body when i heard that growl was nothing compared to the fear and the adrenaline that runs through your body when you get shot I need you to understand this. There is no comparison. It was two different types of fear. This fear I felt outside at night in that darkness, it was almost as if I was helpless as it descended upon me. The next thing I notice is eyes. I'm talking about eyes shine all over the place. To our left in the tree line, eyes shine. To our right, there was this high grass, there was eye shine in the grass. And I'm not talking about no little bitty eyes, man. Now, take your standard smartphone that you might be holding in your hand right now, break it in half, put one to the right side, one to the left side of your face. That's how big these eyes were all over the place. And it was in that moment right then and there that I realized why Joe and the rest of these guys were here because none of them panicked. When I tell you they didn't panic, they were calm, they were communicating, hey, you see that over there? Yeah, I got it over there. You see this? I got it. Okay, guys, let's start moving. Nobody shoot. Let's start moving. And so now we're picking up the pace, moving out of the area, and they start to move a little bit faster than I can move, almost leaving me behind. And one of them, I can't tell you which one of them felt threatened because he started shooting. Now, let me tell you something. When them boys got to shooting, it sounded like 4th of July out there. Pop, 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 boom, boom, pop, 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 boom, 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 boom. The shit was crazy and insane you know how the military movies when people are retreating one guy will stay stationary and it's like they play leapfrog and the other guy runs further out stops starts shooting and then other guys run past him they start doing this shit and i'm with joseph joe runs way out and stops and says stay right here with me and as this is happening i'm starting to realize wait eventually it's going to be our turn to be closest to what they're shooting at and sure enough couple of seconds later it was our turn to be way behind everybody else and man when i tell you i got a glimpse at what he was shooting at and it looked like a freaking giant black cow but cows don't move that fast it's how big it was it was as big as a cow but there is no way that a cow could run that fast scared the shit out of me and i take off running screw the leapfrogging Screw the leapfrogging, the cover firing. I didn't give a damn. I'm running full speed back to that security cab. Now, listen to me when I say this to you. When I tell you I run as fast as I can and get back to the little security cabin, lock the doors, and I'm sitting there. They are outside for the next 10, 15 minutes shooting. And then all three of them come to the cabin, not breathing hard, calm as they can be, and say, okay, we need to wipe everything. It's time to go. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, nope, we need to wipe everything. It's time to go. Two of them split off to go deal with the people who were staying there that night. And Joseph looks at me and says, come on, we're getting in the vehicle and we're going. Listen, this whole evacuation takes about 12 minutes. Joseph takes me back to where my car was parked. I get in my car and I start heading my ass home. 
Now listen, by Thursday, I'm back in the hood panicking. I'm still holding on to this 25 racks that Buzz gave me. I don't have no way of getting contact with Joe, so I'm just sitting there, twiddling my thumbs, playing video games, smoking weed, trying to figure out what's going to happen. Saturday rolls around. My nerves are shot. I'm talking about they completely shot. I step outside to smoke a cigarette. Here come that black Tahoe riding up the street. Bugs pulls up with all three of them guys. All three of them get out first. And I'm saying to myself, this is about to be some fucking bullshit, man. He rolls down the window. He's like, hey, man, hey, come talk to me. Listen to me. I'm trying to read Joe's face to see what type of situation I'm in. But he's got that stone cold grizzled look on his face like he don't give a damn. What happens? I walk up to the vehicle. I and Bugs says, yeah, man, Joe tell me shit went real bad that them things came back, man. They had to start shooting. It went bad. I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I don't know what to tell you. I didn't have nothing to do with it. I was doing what you told me to do. That's when Buzz looks at me and says, man, you know how to pay that sheriff off over there and shut that spot down. But I'm about to open up another spot. I wanted to see if you wanted to invest some of the money I gave. Now, Paul, stop right here. To the non-conniving individual, the honest person, this sounds like it's a legit offer. Like, yeah, yeah, you my guy. You know about what's going on. You know, I want you to invest the money I gave you. But to me, this was a threat. I mean, if you wanted me to invest the money, you could have just called me. You didn't have to pull up heavy with three military guys and pull up on a block to make a statement. See, in my mind, Bugs was telling me, give me my fucking money back. But he was allowing me to save face to seem like I was investing. So I'm like, look, Bugs, I got 22000 of it left over. I'll give it to you. And if you need the rest, give me a couple of days. I'll get that to you. He looks at me and says, that's okay. Just give me 20 and you'll hear back from me in like a week. So I go inside, get $20,000. Hand him $20,000 cash. A week passes, I ain't hear shit from him. And guess what? I don't want to hear a damn thing from Bugs ever again. I don't want nothing to do with his little stupid ass Airbnbs out in the middle of the woods where Monsters is. Nothing. I don't want nothing to do with it at all. Accept the loss, I'm hard headed. There's a little bit of madness to my method. Many falling off that fine line that I'm treading. I risk anything to be great, and I'm not letting nobody rob me of my victory. Number one, that's what I'm meant to be. When by any means, only thing that makes sense to me, I can make nice or make history. I got that. My check one, two, one, two, my check one, two, one, two. Can everybody hear me? Uh huh, uh huh. Can everybody hear me? What's up, ladies and gentlemen? One and only James Williams, Dog Waters. I'm back. And man, I'm just dropping a little Liz's Eye stream to holler at y'all. Now, yesterday, I was sharing you guys with some of you guys my philosophies and theories over what I've learned, uh, the time period that I've been here involved in this field, and just my data collection. And my thoughts on the data that's been collected. Hold on, I need to do something. I'm going to pause for a second and mute so you don't hear hear all this noise. All right, I'm back. And so, you know, when we talk about the field of cryptids, I kind of alluded to last night how this field is um, a gathering place, sort of say, for people. You know, people who clearly have been through trauma. And it's a little bit more than that. When you really take a deep look at it, it's not only a place where people who've been through certain types of trauma gather. It's a place where people come to experience trauma. And what I mean by that is, oh man, I messed up my jacket with a cigar hole, cigar ash hole. What I mean by that is this. Um, there's a, a significant portion of people who come to this field and they make the decision that they are going to go out and look for these cryptids. And then they find themselves in a situation where they find what they're looking for. 
mm, they didn't have any trauma prior to it. You know, they they were fine. Everything was Gucci for them. And they're like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find Dog Man. I'm going to go out and I'm going to find Bigfoot. And then next thing you know, they experience something and they're changed forever. So that's one category of people in this field. Then, this is the most interesting category, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's like... Um, the more you look at this and the more you're in it you see it so then there's the people who are field researchers and that's used loosely I use that term loosely because I mean I, I've only really seen one crew of people that uh, go into the field and actually collect data um, there's people who go out in the field that document their experiences with cameras right but to be a researcher you got to go into the field and you got to collect data there's only one crew of people I've seen that really record data in the field um, I'll leave their name out of it because whatever um, I promoted them in the past and I still think they're phenomenal but it is what it is um, but then you have people who you can loosely use the term that they're researchers and here's the thing about the research aspect of it. Um, and we're talking about the people who we loosely call researchers. And I want to pull the scales back from you guys' eyes. Have you noticed, and this is not talking about anybody in particular, because people like to take things you say and, and make it about them. Um, I'm a man. If I'm going to say something about you, I'm going to say your name. But have you noticed that those who go into the field and do research, the loose form of research, over time, they end up taking on uh, what I would call the characteristics of being possessed by a spirit. Now, some people may say, well, DW, you're tripping. There's no such thing as spirit um, possession. But when you really look close at it, you'll see that those people's personalities change over a period of time you'll see their physical appearance changing over a period of time you'll see that well you guys don't know these things because you're not really behind the scenes but behind the scenes you'll find that they went from being a non-drug user to a drug user from a non-alcoholic to an alcoholic you find all these different tendencies that are associated we're going out into the field and doing research. Now, why am I talking about this? Bada bing, bada boom. And there's some kind of coming down the pipeline that I'm going to prove some things to you guys on real soon. Um, but it's important that you know this um, about this field. And it's important that you understand this about the field because at the end of the day, um, what we give our attention to is what we invite into our household. The people that we give our attention to are the people that we come into agreement with. I feel like my audio is off. Hold on a second. Just one second. I'll be right back. It's not that bad. Um, and so it really boils down to levels of understanding. It really, really does. It boils down to you having levels of understanding of what you're participating in and what you're looking at and what you're seeing. Again, it's important that um, you know these things for what I'm going to do next. So, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, based on the data that I've gathered, the experiences that I've had in this field, um, if you see someone going out into the field consistently, consistently and religiously looking for these cryptids, you're going to notice changes in their personality. I mean, significant changes in their personality. Um, they'll go from... Not just their personality. Let me just break it down. You're going to see significant changes in their household. You're going to see significant changes in their physical features. And then you'll see significant changes in their personality. And when those things start to happen and combine, it creates this gigantic ball of chaos. And oftentimes that chaos is displayed in the public's eye. I think that's where a lot of the crazy foolishness comes in this field. Um, and it's dangerous in the sense that... Um, I wouldn't say it's dangerous like in a sense that somebody is really going to get hurt. Um, people who talk ain't about doing nothing. But 
it's dangerous in the sense that it's dangerous for that person and those individuals. And I'm convinced, 100% convinced that going into the field, searching for these things, allows spirits to attach to you. And it's been quantified and labeled as the hitchhiker theory um, because that's what people come up with a name for it. And you see that all over the place. I'm like, oh, you know, is the hitchhiker theory real? Well, absolutely it's real. Um, hitchhiker means something or someone that catches a ride with you back or you... It, the significant thing about being hitchhiker is if you think about the theory of what happens when someone hitchhikes, the terminology. Imagine a scene. You and I are driving down the road. We see someone on the side of the roadway. We pull over. They're there waiting for a ride. We have to give them permission to get in our vehicle. That's what a hitchhiker is. Someone you gave permission to get in. It ain't like a hitchhiker is somebody that you just riding down the road and they appear in your car. It's a thing about giving permission to become to get in your vehicle. And it's the same concept when it comes to people who decide they're going to go into the woods and they're going to look for these creatures and these entities and then they come home and they experience um, all kinds of paranormal, supernatural activity. But nobody explains the hitchhiker theory at its core. The name itself um, signifies what it is. It's you giving permission. The question is, you may say, well, hey, DW dog, you know, I ain't giving nothing permission. Like, I done been in the woods and stuff done followed me home, homie. I ain't, I didn't tell it followed me home. Well, you actually did when you went. You was coming in agreement when you went out there. Now, if you're going out there and you're not protected in any way, shape, or form, you don't have any covering when you go, then bro, yeah, you come into agreement with it going there. And that's all it boils down to. And so that's the danger of um, what the researchers, the ones that I call loosely uh, titled researchers do. Now, the, the ones who actually collect real data create like documentary style videos for you to see. They collect wind, they collect time, they collect temperature, they collect those things. They're in the same danger. The difference is they're out there for a specific reason to gather data. And I believe that there's a strong distinction um, between the two. The distinction between I'm out here with a specific purpose to research, collect data, gather information, and bring it back and present it versus I'm out here just wandering through the woods and looking. Those who wander through the woods, it seems as if those ones that just go out there wandering endlessly are the ones that have the most significant problems. I mean, huge problems. And those problems often manifest in drug abuse and drug addiction. Now, I've seen it. Many of you have seen it and you don't know what you're looking at when you see it, when you see it, because it's kind of people do their best to disguise it um but it's a sad thing it truly truly is a sad thing and i just i'm getting ready to do another story that touches on this well this story that i'm presenting to you right now touches on this exact same thing um someone who calls themselves a researcher and it's the light version of a researcher I, another word for the light version i call is a worshiper um you intending to go out there and kill one you're intending to go out there just because you're curious. You're intending to go out there just because you want to see something. Or you're intending to go out there to prove someone wrong. These type of things happen to these people. And it's important that you understand this. It's important you understand this before you decide you are going to go out into the field. Excuse me, quote unquote, looking for dog man, looking for Bigfoot, looking for the chupacabra ghost hunting it really doesn't matter what it is understand the theory of coming into agreement with things before you go out there and i dare to say this if you're already a bad person and don't get me wrong there's bad people on this planet if you're already a wicked person don't go because they got a special present out there for the wicked they, they love wicked people and the spirits that possess these things 
absolutely love to savage wicked people. And the state of being wicked is funny because when you start talking about wickedness, um, it's not a stationary state. It's a, a, a state of mind, a state of being that's um, in juxtaposition of being a righteous person, right? Um, for me personally, my righteousness comes from Jesus Christ, and it is what it is. I am never going to be righteous. But if you're outside of that righteousness, um, then there's grades of wickedness. I mean, there's different levels of wickedness. Another thing that you'll find that people experience in this field um, is strong sexual perversion. People who are quote unquote researchers who have encounters, I'm talking about completing, being complete and utter perverts. And just, I mean, crazy, perverted, insane stuff. Now, that's not just for the researchers. There's been a number of witnesses that I've talked to uh, and a number of people in the community that I've talked to um, when we're doing spiritual warfare and we're just talking to them about um, things that are going on and things that happen in their life. It's amazing how there's a partnership with pornography with people who are interested in this field. This is a grown man and grown woman talk that we're doing right now, not like kitty talk. Um, and it affects their household and affects their family and affects their relationships. One conversation I was having with a young lady, she said, well, my husband seems to be addicted to pornography and it affected our life and it affected our bedroom. And I explained to her, I said, the problem with having that addiction is that um, over time, it takes more and more uh, exotic stuff to get a person aroused. And so you take a person who's looking at pornography on a religious basis and you take a person like, a, you know, I mean, maybe a P. Diddy, somebody that's known for really being out there and wild. Um, P. Diddy physically actually went through the acts of doing crazy stuff till he got to the point to where nothing would satisfy him. But through your eye gate, which is an eye gate, which your eyes are the windows to the soul, you've gone through it directly by seeing all these different things. And it's, it's a hole that you dig yourself into. And it keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then nothing really arouses the person. And these are things that I want to share with you guys as we move forward. Because frankly, these are the effects of people who pursue this. And I've, I've alluded to these things by sharing it in story and um, sharing it here and there. But it's, we hit the point now where it's just time just to talk plain about things um, and not beat around the bush. So you don't have to tell me if you're going through this. You have to tell me if you experienced this. We did an experiment yesterday where we talked about how people found themselves in this field. If you go back and look at that video, the response is overwhelming. Were you in a broken or weakened state when you found this topic or when you had your encounter? I asked people to put ones in the chat and we got a boatload of ones. That proves that I know what I'm talking about. You go back and listen to my last call-in show. Off rip, just ask the guy, hey, man, what condition were you in when you had your encounter, blah, blah, blah. He said, hey, man, I, was, I had just went through a divorce. It's, and it's all in the data. I mean, it's there. I mean, it's there for you to see. And I want you to, I want your ears to hear the truth as you listen. Because there's a lot of stories that people put out. You know, stories over here, stories over there. This person's stuff's fake. This person's f to stuff is fake and all the rest of this. But if you understand the um, the symptoms is what I'll call it, then you can truly tell if a story is real or fake or not because it's going to have the symptoms, period. If nobody's presenting you the symptoms that lead to an encounter and the symptoms after an encounter, then there's only two things. Either the story's not real or they don't really care to present you with all of the information. So um, this brand, the Dark Waters brand, has been built on providing true vetted stories from day one. I think um, in, many, in many instances it was a mistake for growth, but over time I come to learn that I'm not here for me, um, and that's not why I'm here. So I got to kind of rock with what I got and do what the Lord tells me to do and keep it moving because it's not about me. 
nonetheless I want you guys to actually see this that's why there was Dogman 101, 102, 103 uh, this next one is 104 that's coming because I want you to see it for what it is not for what people tell you it is not for what people monetize it to be because there's a serious effect of monetization on this topic I mean it really is like um, if you go back six seven years ago the cryptid dogman topic Bigfoot has always been Bigfoot right like I mean Bigfoot was the biggest topic in the cryptid world back then um, but dogman has taken off um, primarily due to the monetization of it and the amount of fanaticism associated with listening to the stories and that fanaticism is displayed I mean it's always on full display when there's some type of conflict right I mean it's insane nonetheless if you've been with me from the beginning you've seen this we done been through all the, the craziness that none of that bothers me the point I'm making is is if you understand the cult like aspects of the subject it only further supports what I'm laying out to you and the evidence that I'm giving you and the words that I'm saying so there's a spiritual component to this there's a physical component to it broken people weak people not necessarily a weak individual there's a difference between being in a state of brokenness and a state of a state of weakness as opposed to being broken or weak and sometimes in some cases the person's body is physically broken when they find this in other cases they're in a broken state in a humbled state things happen in life to humble us right um most people don't understand that but things happen in life as an opportunity to be humbled and learn and grow that's the only way we learn and grow is we go through things um but it's that initial state of growth where people have encounters find this field find this subject and that's what kind of derails them i wouldn't even call it a derailing like um let me paint a picture for you you're on a train you're riding down the train track choo choo sugar 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 choo choo right and up ahead is a fork in the tracks you can go left or you can go right um but in order for that decision to be made you should be um pulling the lever to go right or go left well you really need to go to the right Th that's what you're designed to do that's what this trial this problem this issue this thing that you're facing right now is designed for you to go to the right but something sparks your interest it's shiny it's sparkly it, it, it makes you feel good and then you start to go left and then you start to find what you believe is community to the left um, friendship to the left but you should be going right that's what a reality that's what the good stuff is but you end up going left the further and further you go down that track you start to evolve and you start to change you start to see things differently and you get to the point further down the track you go you get to the point to where you look back and you realize you're a part of a group that is so far away from what you would normally do that you find yourself confused how do I know this know how because I've talked to people and I'll bring it up to you so um, when I was going through the conflict with Vic Kunda by the way again congratulations Vic on hitting 100,000 I think he's the most consistent guy there is and I think he deserves 100,000 and he is a pillar in the dog man community whether people like him or not um, there came a point where I told people I said listen I forgive y'all right straight up I forgive you man bada bing bada boom well import all these emails I'm not talking about 10 I'm talking about hundreds of emails thousands of comments just pouring in pouring in and it was people who were saying man you know I don't know how I got to this point to where I had given so much attention and time to something like this now again I'm not attributing this to Vic in any way shape or form because people like to twist things so I'll be very specific about my words but people were saying I don't know how I got to this point point," and that's when I really started paying attention 
to that aspect of it. I'm sitting there, smoking my cigar, reading the, reading the emails and saying, huh, there's more than one person that's saying they don't know how they got here. Where is here? What, is, what does here actually mean? What, what are they talking about? So I kept reading and kept reading and kept reading and kept reading and kept reading. And over time of reading those emails, and I'm not talking about like just once or twice. I'm talking about I read them, say them, go back and read them again. Just trying to let my mind wrap around um, what's truly being said and what's behind the words. That's when I came to realize and understand that these were people who found themselves in places with behavior patterns that they would have never thought that they would uh, behave in ways that they would have never thought they would have behaved. And the significance of that, um, turning themselves over to emotions and feelings that weren't quite theirs. And that's the best way to sum it up. And it's a turning over. Again, coming into agreement with and turning yourself over to something. I, I think it's this may be too deep for some people. Some people just want to hear stories. Um, some people don't really care to understand the train track that they're riding on. They don't. They don't care. They don't care about the, the train they're riding on or the destination or what's the destination after that. But I reached the point where I'm just going to tell you like it is. No holes barred, no sugar, no cream. Just dark, caffeine-filled coffee, just like my skin. And I'm just going to tell you like it is. It's a place where people find themselves. And so, if you are listening to me right now, and you're one of those people that realize that you're in that place, turn around and start riding the train back. Start walking back up the track. Because um, there's an easy way and there's a hard way. I mentioned somebody else. And I'm proud of this guy. And I haven't mentioned him much. But I'm very, very proud of this man. Um, James Tucker. About the nightmares. Anybody who's been here for a while. I mean a long time know that. We was ride or die for a minute. We had a conflict. About a bing, about a boom. Things are said. Conversations happen. Beefs is squashed. By the way, that's what men do. They squash issues. They don't... Um, men talk and squash issues. They don't talk at each other. They talk to each other. And that's how you know what... That's how you can tell who's a man and who's not a man. You know what I'm saying? Pardon my language. I'm going to use the word. You can tell who's a man and who's a bitch by who's willing to talk to each other. All right, so... Um, when he first told me he found the Lord, I was skeptical. It really was. I was like, man, I don't, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I know you. I know what you did. I know. I mean, from a not from a job standpoint, what you did for a living. I mean, I know what you did in a spirit realm standpoint. And over time, talking to him, um, the Lord has found him and changed him in ways that are profound, glaringly obvious. Now he's going through a sacrifice right now. Um, because God demands the sacrifice of obedience from you. Um, so he's going through his sacrifice right now. And I want to encourage him to stay on that road of sacrifice. And be obedient to the Lord. And let him reward you for that obedience. Because quite frankly, his rewards are amazing. But nonetheless, he's an example of what happens when you get to the end of the road. Now, he could have went that way at any point in time in his life. Frankly, I mean, he could have went that way at any point in time in his life. But anybody who knows Vault knows how Vault is. But he got there. And I'm proud of him for getting there. Now, our relationship will probably never be the same, but I'm still proud of him for getting there. And I wanted to say that publicly. Um, because at the end of the day, your eternal soul is more important than this fleshly body and this fleshly experience. But it's, he's an example of what I mean. And I'll go back 
And I'll remind you guys, we had Dogman Cams running. For the record, I founded dogmancams.com. Um, we get to the point where he has cameras uh, in his backyard, which there was real activity. And there comes a point where he gets hit with something. Um, nose bleeding, things going crazy, and then things fall apart for him. I mean, really fall apart. Um, and then he goes on his journey with the Lord. I don't want to see other people have to go through that um, because it's a it's a tearing down process that you don't have to go through. It's a tearing down in a process and a rebuilding process that you don't have to go through. Now, for me personally, I went through the tearing down process and a rebuilding process um, prior to YouTube. Um, and my rebuilding, my tearing down was prior. My rebuilding was public, um, which is a very, very different thing to experience when your rebuilding is being done in the public's eye. But it's suiting and fitting for me and for what I've done in my lifetime. Um, because a lot of stuff I've done throughout my whole life has been in the public side. So I don't get the privilege, or I didn't get the privilege of my tearing down and rebuilding being private. Mine had to be public um, because of a lot of things I did in the past and the work I've done in the past. But nonetheless, I'm not speaking to you about these things just randomly. I'm not speaking from a hypocritical standpoint. I'm speaking truth from my own experience and the experience around um, the people around me. And so I want to share these concepts with you kind of as a heads up. Kind of like, hey, look, just, just take a look around you. See what's up. See what's happening. Make sure you're not getting ready to run into this wall that other people run into. Or if you're standing at the wall and you're staring at the wall and trying to figure out what the hell is going on, you don't have to be, you don't have to have your head rammed through it. You can kind of turn around and go the other way. Other way is Jesus Christ. Go that way. Go that way quickly. The faster you go, the less painful it'll be. And that's the honest of God truth. The faster you go in that direction, the less pain you'll experience. Um, because that's how this system works. That's how God's system, a correct, correction works. Um, it's a system that's in place. Oh, buddy, you get corrected. So I don't necessarily want to see people go through it unless they absolutely have to. There's some people, you know, they're frankly, they're hard-headed and God going to put them through what they got to go through. Other people, you know, you can turn around and go in the direction you're supposed to. So I want to encourage you to go in that direction. Go in the right direction. Peace out.